I do not think that prison is a place apart. I actually think, and this is the most frightening thing, that prison is where they try things out, forms of abuse, forms of torture, that they're then going to use on the rest of us out in the community. So it's very important. It's pretty much secret what goes on in prison, and we need to make it more public. I think the people in this room share the opportunity of knowing what's going on in prison. And I think we have to make that very public because more and more it becomes the sort of natural order out in the, in the, in the community. Let me start with a premise, which is that I believe solitary confinement is one logical result of mass incarceration. I spent the first part of my career testifying in court about crowding and how crowding causes an increase in violence, an increase in mental illness, in mental breakdown, in suicides, causes an increase in just about every medical condition that has a psychological edge to it. For instance, ulcer, hypertension, uh, skin allergies, asthma, etc. And uh, that was well known, and I testified in many cases about that. Because it was well known that crowding causes all of those problems, it's unconstitutional to serve their time in such situations. Um, I think that a historic wrong turn occurred in the 1980s. What was going on was that crowding since the 1970s was just massive. By the 1980s, we had four or five times as many prisoners as we had and as the programs of the prisons were built for. And the violence in the 1980s was out of control. There was, was what was called riots, and many of them weren't riots, they were actually protest movements from inside prison which got stigmatized, and, um, or they were a combination of the two. And there was a dismantling of rehabilitation going on because of a sense that uh, in, in the more conservative legislatures that we were coddling prisoners. So there was a dismantling of rehabilitation, and there was a massive crowding by four times uh, in that period, and there was massive violence. What happened is the powers that be decided that the problem wasn't the crowding. The problem wasn't that the institutions were out of control and badly managed, as they were. The problem was the bad apples among the prisoners, and they were going to lock up a certain subgroup of prisoners, the worst of the worst, and that would solve the problem of crowding. And thus we got the, the Supermax prison, which was begun in earnest, started in, in uh, Marion in 1983, but it actually began in earnest with Pelican Bay and Arizona's SNU facilities in the late uh, 1980s. And then we got a proliferation of these Supermax facilities. The sociologists talk about attribution error. That is, you take a classroom, and you move the classroom size from 20 to 30, say in the second grade. And you do that because of budget cuts in education. And then certain children start acting up in school. And the reason is because the teacher can't pay enough attention to them and their specific learning needs. So the kids get restless and they start getting into trouble. Now what does the system do? It has two choices. It can either identify certain kids as problem kids and then give them or discipline them and kick them out of school. Or we could say that it was a mistake to increase the classroom size from 20 to 30. But we had that exact situation in the prisons, and what they opted to do was to do the attribution error of blaming individuals and putting certain people who were stigmatized as the worst of the worst into supermax prisons. And then that sort of grew and grew and became uh, irreversible. Uh, one of my uh, jobs here is to talk about the negative effects from a psychiatric perspective, and that's what I do in court. And I outline what you've heard very poignant descriptions of in this morning's presentations, particularly by Brian Nelson. Um, a relatively stable prisoner when placed in solitary confinement. Now, Moumia Abu Jamal has described this as living in your bathroom. The cell is about the size of a small bathroom, and the toilet is actually right there, right next to the head of your bed. And you put a person in there and leave them there. Actually, uh, when Jean showed the picture of the uh, exercise yard at Pelican Bay's uh, shoe, that's a very large yard relative to the yards in most of the other prisons around the country. The dog runs 
are actually divisions of a yard that size. That yard is about 20 feet wide and about 60 feet long. And the dog runs that the prisoners talk about are actually taking a place like that and subdividing it into four lanes. And then that becomes what's called the dog run. So it's even worse than what you saw in the slides. And um, what happens to people in these situations is they get a series of predictable symptoms. Everybody gets these symptoms. For instance, headaches. 80% of prisoners in SHU complain of headaches like they've never had before. Sleep problems. Sleep is an objective problem because the lights are on all night. There's noise all night. It's also a part of the symptoms, the psychological symptoms of isolation. They're isolated and they're idle. They have nothing meaningful to do in their cell. Um, anxiety mounts. Panic attacks are very, very prevalent. There's anger, and then there's this symptom that I hear about universally all over the country, and it's among prisoners who don't talk to each other, and that is a dread reaching panic proportions that their anger is going to get out of control and they're going to get into further trouble. When you hear a symptom like that from all over the country, and I've been in about 20 states looking at these units, uh, you start to think that's something to do with the isolation itself. What happens if you have no ability to check on the negative feelings towards you? In other words, you're in a cell, and there are officers talking to each other down the hall and laughing. And you have the thought, they're laughing about me. You have absolutely no way to t figure that out, whether that was true or not. And so you, next time you hear them laughing, oh, now they found out that whatever, that I did something yesterday or whatever, and they're out to get me. Or if you're of a different race than those officers, they're racist, they're going to kill me. And these ideas keep growing because there's absolutely no way to check them out. You're having no human contact, so you have no way to test it. So that's how paranoia gets out of control. Then another universal symptom is cognitive and memory problems. What happens is people in this kind of situation, very stable people, have trouble concentrating. They can't think coherently because usually our thinking is tied to our productive activities. I sit and read something and that helps organize my thoughts. If I don't have anything to read and I'm alone in the cell and all I've got is erratic noise, not even meaningful communication, uh, then I have to start having trouble concentrating and thinking. And I also start having memory problems. So one of the questions I ask is, do you read? 40% of prisoners are not literate wow. at, at a level of reading. But of the ones who read, if you're in a cell by yourself, reading is about one of the best things you can do to kind of stay in touch, keep your mind exercised. And the prisoners, to some extent, it varies from person to person, and some force themselves to read. But they tell me, no, I don't read. And I say, why is that? It sounds like it's the only possible activity you have. They said, yeah, but I forgot what I read three pages earlier. I can't keep a coherent story going, so I've just given up. That's an almost universal symptom. Um, there are ritualistic compulsive acts like cleaning the cell six times a day. Pacing, and Brian, I'm not saying you pacing as a compulsive act, but um, they pace so that the, the floor gets worn down. Again. Depression, severe depression, and it, it really, it's organized around despair. The despair is, I'm never going to get out of here. And there's a lot of crime. And that creates a problem in men prisoners. This also, by the way, happens with women. Uh, women have social access. And um, crying for men is a particular problem because, you know, think about it. We were raised and told by our coaches, don't cry. You don't be a sissy. Don't be, you're acting like a girl. And that's part of male culture. So they get into a supermax situation and they find themselves crying and they can't control themselves. And they tell me in one way or another, I'm losing my mind. Right, those are what I call relatively stable people. Now what happens to someone who's prone to mental illness? Well, all of the things I just described to you are precipitating factors of an acute psychotic episode. That is, if you have paranoid ideas that you cannot reality test, and you're prone to psychosis, you start having a breakdown. If you have mounting anxiety and mounting anger, those are precipitants of psychosis. So psychotic episodes occur a lot in, in these isolation units. 
I'm often asked, is it that the people with mental illness are selectively placed in solitary confinement? Or do the conditions of solitary confinement cause them to break down and have psychotic episodes? And the answer is both. If you think about it, most people go to prison in their late teens and early 20s. And if they're going to be locked in solitary, that's when they get to solitary. Most first breakdowns in schizophrenia occur in late teens and early 20s. So there's a significant population of people who are unknown to the mental health system, do not even know themselves that they're evolving a psychotic condition, get arrested before they have a mental breakdown and have their mental breakdown in prison. They are really out of luck because the mental health services that some are on average awful. And the behaviors that they perform as part of their psychotic episode are going to be interpreted as rule breaking and they are going to be put in solitary confinement. So selectively at the Wabash Valley Correctional Institute in Indiana, I went in there and started interviewing people and found some of the most disturbed people I've ever met in my life. And I've had a career in state hospitals and psychiatric hospitals, but these were more severely disturbed than I had ever seen. And I ended up counting, and there was 50%. This was when the Human Rights Watch wrote the report Cold Storage. 50% of the prisoners in the SHU had serious mental illness. I went and reported that to the superintendent, which is what they call wardens in some states. And the warden said, yeah, we use the SHU to, to control fire. mental illness. So they were putting people in the situation that made their mental illness worse. So psychosis is, I've seen some of the worst cases in my entire career. Suicide is very prevalent. I'm gonna give you a statistic. Gene gave it to you in terms of California. California has 60 or 70% of successful suicides. That means when someone dies, occur among the five or 6% of the population who are in solitary confinement. That is a stunning statistic. That basically means as much as information as we can get from statistics, that solitary causes suicide. The national average is about 50. New York reports 43%, other states report 50, Oregon reports 60. So it varies, but the average is 50%. That is a stunning factor. Again, the reason is despair. Most people in SHU tell me, now different states have different reasons to put people in solitary confinement. One reason is that you've misbehaved and you have a certain number of tickets with a certain amount of solitary time to do. That's a disciplinary reason, punitive segregation. Some states, California for instance, does mostly gang validation. That is, they think you're a gang member when you are or you aren't in their wrong amount of time. And if you have a gang validation charge leading to your placement in Pelican Bay Shoe for a life sentence, you're never getting out of there unless your term ends, because this is a sentence within your prison sentence. So you're never going to get out. It's an indeterminate sentence. Thank you. But even the people who get, say, a year sentence to solitary confinement because of a series of disciplinary tickets, they will tell me, I'm never going to get out of here. I'm going to die. And I'll say, what are you talking about? You've only got a year sentence to shoot. And they said, yeah, but that's if I stay ticket free for that year that I'm in the shoe. When I'm in here, I get so angry and my behavior gets so out of control that I give lip to the guard, they write me a ticket, and then I've got another year to do, and that process will never end. So while despair is a symptom of being in isolation, it's also an objective reality of where people are. Um, in solitary confinement, a culture of punishment evolves, and it's a ratcheting effect. The ratcheting effect is this. There's nothing good that can be given to any prisoner in solitary confinement. There are no privileges. There are no amenities. Rehabilitation has been described. The place is anti-rehabilitative. If they give you a stack of papers and they say, read this and your anger will be more in control. First of all, that's entirely wrong empirically. That is, the place is going to build more anger in you than those pieces of the paper will help you control. But second of all, it's a rare prisoner to get anything from those pages without human contact. So basically, there's nothing going on in this cell. Nothing that prepares a person when they get out to be a... Uh, successful citizen.
there's only negative things that can be given to them if they break the rules. For instance, uh, we talked about contraband this morning. Contraband can be something in Michigan, if you go to the doctor and the doctor prescribes Motrin for your sore joints, and you keep the bottle in your cell because you don't want to have to go back to the doctor and pay a fee and such next time. And the uh, medication limit runs out, and you have that in your cell. That is contraband, and that gets you a disciplinary ticket. So what happens is every little uh, breach of, of the absolute rigid uh, protocol gets you a ticket, and then you get more and more tickets, longer term and shoe, and it goes on forever. Now what happens to the guards who are doing these kind of punishments? They have nothing good to give, 